We can't really talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence without talking about the Fermi paradox. So we've seen uh, the argument made by the Drake equation, which is that there should be all kinds of intelligent civilizations in the universe uh, based on the just enormous number of stars that there are and therefore planets and then planets that develop life, all that kind of stuff, right? We've seen that, that argument. Well, <clears throat> the response to that in the Fermi paradox and what makes it a paradox is, is the thought that if there are so many of these intelligent civilizations, then why haven't we heard from them? And more specifically, why haven't we seen them here on the earth? So here's kind of the, the, the thinking, right? Is that if you really had all these intelligent civilizations, surely one of them would be so, at least one, probably many would be so sophisticated that they would be traveling between the stars, right? And traveling to other planets. In which case we would have seen them here on earth, right? And so the fact that we haven't seen them here on earth suggests that there must not be that many of them that are really sophisticated. And so maybe we shouldn't even be looking for signals from them. That's kind of the way the, the argument of the Fermi paradox goes, right? Um, so let's take a look at that and see some of the responses to the Fermi paradox because it's, it's a little bit of a controversial uh, argument in, in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The first I want to mention is, is the idea of, of alien civilizations traveling here. Part of that argument is to say we can't even imagine how sophisticated their technology might be. And so they could have things, we, we could imagine things like self-replicating robots, right? So here's just a simple image illustrating what that could look like, right? Imagine a robot that you make that goes to a planet and harvests the resources of that planet to make copies of itself. And then it's able to then launch and go to another planet and make copies of itself. If you had a machine that could do that, right? Which, which we almost do have machines that if you give it the bare bones already, uh, you know, humanity does, where you give it the essential elements, it can construct a copy of itself. But imagine one that could also harvest the raw materials from a planet and then produce a copy. You could, <clears throat> you could imagine uh, that it spreads extremely quickly, right? That, that kind of technology could spread extremely quickly and you could spread throughout a galaxy very rapidly. Um, here's another image just showing a really simple self-replicating machine. It's like a robotic arm taking pieces, another robotic arm taking pieces, and then another robot, and just keeps making copies of itself, right? So if we could imagine, if we can even imagine technology like this, what technology is beyond our imagination that would allow a civilization to, to explore? So what do we do with this? Like, are there any responses to this paradox? Um, or is this proof somehow that that intelligent civilizations do not exist elsewhere. Well, here's some interesting, um, interesting ways to respond to the uh, Fermi paradox. <clears throat> here's just a bunch of, of kind of possible responses. So one here that's offered is too cool for school. So they call it the entire idea of physical colonization maybe is a hilariously backward concept to a more advanced species. Maybe it's just you know, you can almost see this like when, when Europeans came to America, the Native Americans were like, what do you mean you own land? Like the idea of owning land was just like not even in their, in their frame of the world. Maybe that's how advanced civilizations are. The idea of going to another place, it just sounds ridiculous and colonizing it. And whereas to us, that's something we would think to do. Perhaps, um, so, so that's why we don't see them here, right? So that would, be, that would be a potential explanation of Fermi's paradox, why we don't see them here. Another possible explanation, alien versus predator. So imagine that there are predator civilizations out there and most intelligent life knows better than to broadcast signals and advertise their location. So everyone's super quiet out there because they don't want to trigger this, the predator civilizations. Okay, that fits with some of our sci-fi movies. Okay, so then maybe finish him. There is a super predator species that keeps exterminating all the intelligent civilizations once they get past a certain level. So maybe that's why we don't see intelligent civilization. Okay, so we're like definitely in the domain of science fiction, but uh, nonetheless, these are conversations that happen. All right, how about this one? Silly humans. There's plenty of activity and noise out there, but our technology is too primitive and we're looking for things in the wrong places. So that might suggest that we don't even have the right technology yet. I mean, imagine 100 years ago and we tried to search, we didn't even have radio technology. 
So who's to say that in a hundred years, I mean, it's kind of like the golden record. We sent out a message and it was a record, right? Um, whereas what would be the, how would we send it out today? You know what I mean? Um, how about, an, let's just do a couple more. So spy game, they are, they are using, that is intelligent civilizations are using technology to spy on us. So they're around us, but we can't detect their presence. All right, and then here's conspiracy theory. How about we are receiving contact from other intelligent life, but our governments are hiding it. Okay, and some people feel like that is the case. So a lot of crazy sort of ish ideas, but the, the, the point I hope to make by showing this to you is that um, Fermi's paradox isn't a proof of any sort that, that intelligent uh, extraterrestrial civilizations don't exist. There are other possible explanations as to why we haven't encountered them yet. Um, another interesting idea, though, is that comes up sometimes this idea of filters. And the idea is that civilizations, as they develop, cannot, uh, well, that they, they encounter barriers to ongoing progress. So you could maybe say that in the advancement of human civilization, the invention of, and I just realized I'm wearing a different shirt than I normally do. You caught me. Normally I wear the same shirt so that it's the same shirt in all the videos, but this one, I'm wearing a different shirt. <laughs> we'll see if the next one I'm wearing this shirt or a different one. Okay, so there's these filters to get past. Maybe the invention of electricity, right? Or the discovery of electricity would be a, a great example of, um, of, of a filter, right? If you haven't crossed that, then there's no chance you could communicate. But some of these could be like destructive, like like maybe surviving um, the development of nuclear weapons, right? Maybe that's something that all intelligent civilizations go through and, and, uh, and they have to survive that. And if they don't, if they blow up their whole planet, like we could have done during the Cold War, then, um, then that intelligent civilization ceases to exist. So with these ideas of filters, you could say, well, maybe, maybe we are unique in that we've navigated through some of those filters. We discovered electricity and we've navigated safely through nuclear armament or maybe we haven't yet encountered some major filter and that we won't make it past or maybe we will make it past so maybe this is why there's not very many intelligent civilizations out in uh in space one of the things you see illustrated on this graph here is a, a type 3 civilization a type 3 civilization so these types um, refer to an interesting scale here, uh, the types of advanced civilizations. So this goes back to the 1960s, I believe, something called the Kardashev scale. So this is definitely like in the domain of science fiction, but it's a way of, of thinking about advanced civilizations and trying to measure and quantify how advanced a civilization is. And the way that they, um, that this scale is recommended is by the amount of energy that a civilization is able to harness. All right. So the, the first level of, of um, civilization, a type one civilization would be one that's able to harness all of its planets energy. Okay. So all of the wind, all of the, the chemical energy, and, and it also says here they would have control over all the natural forces on the planet, like volcanoes, weather, and even earthquakes. So um, this is something we can't achieve as a species on our planet, right? We are not capable of controlling these things. We're not capable of harnessing all of our planet's energy. But this is a way of quantifying it to say once you can harness all your planet's energy, okay, then where do you go for more if you're trying to use up even more energy? Now, the, the logic here is that to explore interstellar space would require an enormous amount of energy. So where are you getting that energy from? Well, you have to be taking it from your planet or potentially from your star. So the type two, all right? So we aren't even up to type one in humanity. So th this is all very like futuristic stuff. But a type two uh, society or civilization would be an interplanetary society that can harness the power of their entire star. So we talk about like solar energy here on Earth. We're talking about putting up solar panels to get some of our star's energy. A type two civilization would be one that harnesses all of its star's energy. Somehow it captures the entire energy of its star. It's really kind of unimaginable. But that's this measure of a type two civilization. All right, and then it has examples. Okay, the, for example, the Federation from Star Trek, 
in case that makes sense to you, or the Turians from Mass Effect, the video game, if that makes any sense. They would be examples of type two civilizations. Okay, and then a type three civilization would be someone who could, a civilization that could travel around the galaxy, uh, moving from star to star, colonizing planets. It says, at this juncture, it's likely that cyborgs or cybernetic organisms are now the most highly advanced beings. All right, so for example, the Borg from Star Trek or the Reapers from Mass Effect. All right, I don't know if this is even making any sense. The point I want you to take away from this though is that there is this, this scale out there um, about how advanced is your civilization and that it's tied to the amount of energy you're able to harness. Now, one interesting thing that's referenced here is a Dyson sphere, a mega structure called a Dyson sphere. So if you were to somehow harness all the energy of your sun, how could you do that? Well, imagine building a solar panel that instead of covering your entire planet, because even if it covered your whole planet, you're still not capturing all the energy of the star. Imagine a solar panel structure that surrounded your entire star, like an entire sphere, so that it could capture all the energy of the star. Well, that's this hypothetical object that's called a Dyson sphere. And here's an image or two of what that theoretically could look like. A huge structure in space that's so big, it actually surrounds an entire star. I mean, again, this stuff is kind of unimaginable um, in its in its uh, advanced, the, how advanced it would it would be, um, but people throw these ideas around. Now, one one interesting thing, the reason I wanted to share this Dyson sphere idea here um, is because this actually came up in the news not that long ago, uh, associated with the Kepler Space Telescope, believe it or not, and that is that um, there was an unusual light curve that was detected by the Kepler Space Telescope. Remember, Kepler looks for these drops in brightness um, that are associated with with planets. And uh, there was a star, this KIC 84628528852, and it had a very unusual um, light curve. So it had, it had these little drops, little drops, and then it had one really big drop. And then two years later, it had this series of drops here highlighted in yellow. And you see they're kind of zoomed in there at the bottom. Very weird pattern. And so you'd, you'd ask questions about like, well, what could cause a pattern like this? What could be passing in front of the star that causes its brightness to fluctuate so dramatically in so many different ways? And so when this first came out in the news, one uh, scientist was um, kind of caught the media attention and suggested that maybe this could be a Dyson sphere. You could imagine, maybe you could, I can hardly imagine, but maybe you could imagine a like, partially completed Dyson sphere that's rotating around the star and it partially blocks the star, lets some of its light through, and as it rotates more, lets more light through again. Um, kind of like this Dyson sphere here is showing, right? Like if it had if it was in the process of being built and was partially complete, most of the starlight's still getting through, but some of it's being blocked. And so this light curve, this person was saying, maybe this is uh, observation of a, a Dyson sphere and there's a like super advanced intelligent civilization uh, around the star. Um, I, I don't know how many people took that very seriously, but I have an astronomer friend who was aware of this and, and he didn't like laugh at it. Uh, but that's the sort of <laughs> here. Let me just show you this. So here's another paper though about another star that had an unusual light curve. Um, and this, this is a star called Epic 204278916. And this paper came out, you know, not too long ago. It's the, the paper is called, this is, so this is like a, a professional astronomers wrote this paper. It's like a, a, you know, official publication. The peculiar dipping events in the disc bearing young stellar object, um, yada, yada, yada. And so what they do is they show this light curve, which has similar unusual patterns, right? And what they do is they offer a bunch of suggestions as to what it could, could be its cause. Now in this case, it's a protoplanetary disk involved. They know it's a young star system, so there could be a disk of material, which may be going around like natural dust and rocks and ice that's causing this to happen. And in fact, there are whole classes of stars that, that have these kind of unusual transiting events, that transits that might last for 20 days or more as a portion of a disk blocks the star. So they, but they offer in this paper, they make several different suggestions. 
like it could be a protostellar disk. Let's see, transiting circumstellar clumps, like uh, a stuff in a circular orbit. So they're trying to fit equations to all of these things to say, could this explain the observations we're making? Could it be a Hill sphere ring system? Maybe there's rings around this uh, star and that's what's causing these transits. What else do they suggest? Um, transiting material in an eccentric orbit and then mass constraints. So like how much mass must there be in this material? So you can see they're doing a lot of mathematical analysis to say what natural explanations could there be for these transiting things. So when you hear something in the news, it's like, oh, this crazy thing is evidence of yada yada. You know, know that they're also behind that is a lot of scientific analysis that is asking, you know, what natural explanations there might be for the kind of observations that are being made. Okay, so that's a little taste of the Fermi paradox, right? This idea of how advanced could these civilizations be? And if there are really advanced civilizations, wouldn't they be traveling to the Earth? And why aren't they here? Um, really interesting questions, but definitely getting on the fringes, I feel like, of, of science, science questions and getting more into science fiction. I want to leave you with just this one, um, this one uh, comic from Calvin and Hobbes, a little twist on the Fermi paradox, where, where Calvin is saying, um, sometimes I think that the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that none of it has tried to contact us, right? Which I think is a great twist, right? It's like the complete opposite of the Fermi paradox, where he's saying there must be intelligent life because they haven't shown up here. They must know that they don't want to come here. Um, I think that's kind of a funny twist. So hopefully you found this interesting. I will see you next time.